The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome, church family. And if you're here for the very first time and you have questions about faith, Jesus, the Bible, or maybe even the existence of God, this place is for you. We are so glad you're here. We love you. We really are so glad you're here. And we're believing that when you leave here, you're going to leave full of life and joy. So let's begin this morning uh, just inviting the Holy Spirit to be present with us. And Lord, we thank you that you're already here. And prepare our hearts, Lord. Help us to open our hearts and our minds to your Holy Spirit and to your word. Father, we want to learn today. We want to grow today. We want to bond deeper with our neighbor and with you. And Lord, we just love that you've called us here. And so we give you our burdens, our sorrows, and our victories, everything. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Turn around and shake the hand of the person next to you and say, God loves you, and so do I. We have all dealt with fear in our lives at one time or another. But the good news is, God is stronger than fear. And with Him, all things are possible, meaning that you can overcome even your greatest fears. Today, with your generous gift of any size, you can request How to Face Your Fears, a special two-message audio collection from Pastor Bobby, as well as the new Calm and Courageous Journal. Filled with inspirational quotes and scriptures, this journal provides ample space for you to write down not only what you're afraid of, but also what you've seen God help you overcome in your life. Experience the power of your faithful God. Call or go online today, and for your generous gift of any size, we'll send you the two-message audio CD, How to Face Your Fears, and Calm and Courageous, the new lined paperback journal. My encouragement for you today is you can face your fears. I want to equip you with these brand new resources that will help you win your battle against fear. The fear that you face today is very real, but so is the presence and power of God. With Him, you can overcome your fears. So don't pull back. Instead, step forward in faith today and watch God fight on your behalf.
may be seated. The words of Paul the Apostle found in Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Church family, when we renew our thoughts, everything around us changes. Amen. Please stand and join me in this musical response. Our guest today is Remy Adelaki, and his story is one I've shared before. He just embodies strength and perseverance. He's a former Navy SEAL, and, uh, and he's also an actor and an author. So we're thankful for you. And uh, so his life is an amazing life, is documented in his new book, Transformed. Would you please welcome with me again, Remy Adelaki. Hi, Remy. So you. glad to have you here. What a joy. Well, you have an amazing story. I really want to encourage people to get this book and, and read about it. But let's just hear some of it. First of all, um, you joined the military. You began in the Navy, and you became a SEAL. Tell me about that journey and yeah. sort of how you got there. Well, the, the journey was filled with a lot of obstacles. One, I, I couldn't swim when I joined the Navy. <laughs> uh, oh, hold on. You couldn't swim? <laughs> I couldn't swim. Um, but I had this bright idea that I wanted to be a SEAL. I was skinny, I didn't have the academic scores. And so just getting into SEAL training, you know, just took a lot, a lot of fighting and a lot of persevering. But eventually after a year of, of uh, joining, I was, I was accepted into the program. I met the qualifications. It's amazing. Now don't Navy SEALs, they have to swim, right? Yeah, you have to swim a lot. <laughs> you gotta put explosives under water. Yep. And like, you gotta I don't watch too many movies. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're spot on. And uh, I, I eventually figured it out. And, uh, but training was really hard for me. I, I, a lot of what I struggled with was the water. Yeah. Uh, but eventually I got through. And it's cold water too, right? That's very, a big part of it. Very cold. Yeah. Very cold. <laughs> that was my kryptonite. Wow, <laughs> yeah. So um, you, 
of course, for you, you're a committed Christian. It's a, a big part of, of your story. Um, did you grow up in the church as a disciple of Jesus? or? Yeah, well, you know, my mom, she would take my brother and I to church when we were young, and I did not like it at all. <laughs> and uh, as I grew into my teenage years, I strayed. You know, I, I strayed completely away from the church, and I would fluctuate between atheism and agnosticism, d- yeah. depending on the day of the week. But one day, I, I, I hit rock bottom, and I had my rock bottom moment. And in that time, that's when I cried out to Jesus, because my brother would tell me all the time, when you hit rock bottom, cry out to Jesus. And so I did, and that's when my life began to transform. Wow. Of course, Jesus is that rock, isn't he? Amen. That rock that we hit. And Amen. Isn't it great to have someone in your life like your brother to sort of uh, guide you in that, that path? It's amazing. And, and you actually weren't born in the States, right? You were born in West Africa? Yep. I was born in West Africa. I lived the first five years of my life in Nigeria. Uh, my dad, he was a well-known Nigerian engineer, and because of his success, we lived a life of wealth. And uh, In 1987, the Nigerian government stripped us of everything, so we went from rich to poor, and that's when my mom brought us to the States. Yeah, and your dad died, didn't he? Yes, yes, he died uh, October 1987. Wow, so it's it's amazing. I mean, all of this is in your book, and it's incredible that you came from, you know, just being impoverished in Nigeria to being a successful actor and a Navy SEAL and just a man who has committed his life to God. I think it's just awesome. Thank you. We're so thankful for you. So your your SEAL background then eventually led to you uh, filming a scene for like a TV show. (laughs) Tell me about how that happened. Yeah, I was sitting in my my computer one day writing papers for grad school and I got the phone call from a, a woman who worked with a directed by the name of Michael Bay. I've heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they were looking for somebody to play a role in a little film called Transformers. And I raised my <laughs> hand and said, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> and uh, one day turned into six months. And that's what kind of opened up the doors for me to get into acting. That's awesome. You were a villain, right? Villain in the beginning, but that turned into, into a good guy towards the end. <laughs> oh, that's great. It's like your real life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, awesome. exactly. Transformed. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually that leads, so, so mm-hmm. that, that really is a big part of your story, right? You, you utterly were transformed mm-hmm. uh, through, and what transformed you? What do you think was this, is the main thing that led to that transformation? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, you know, I, I fought against faith in Christ for a long period of time, and I tried to fix myself, I tried to transform myself, and nothing worked for many, many years, and then finally, you know, I hit that rock, yeah. and, and that's where that transformation took place. You yeah, know? that's amazing. I, I, I just want people to hear this. There's so many people mm-hmm. that think, you know, that, that they can never be a person for the Lord, a, a mm-hmm. good person, they can never beat their addiction, they can yeah. never be a good dad, a good husband a good teacher, they can never get an education, a lot of these things, they can never you know, succeed at their work. What do you say to those people that, are, that just look at you and are like, I could never be like that guy? I say to them, look at me. <laughs> read my book, read my story, see who I used to be, and, and I'm a prime example. So I, I just say, you know, look at me, look at so many other people. You know, look at Paul, look at, you know, yeah. you know Peter, look at all of these people. The, those examples are, are great examples. Well, and I hope that the person that takes your advice someday can say that to someone else, too. Amen. And it, it's an amazing book. The book is Transformed by mm-hmm. Remy Adelanke. And Remy, we thank you so much. I want to encourage you to read this book, to get it. Maybe give it to somebody that's going through the valley. I think it'd make a great gift. And uh, it's an amazing, amazing story. There's so much more that we didn't get to. But Remy, thank you and appreciate your story. God bless you. you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And 
Would you join me in a time of prayer together? Gracious God, we've heard this morning that you're the everyday God. You're the resurrected Lord who has chosen to come and live life with us, Emmanuel, God with us. And for that, we praise you and honor you this day. Lord, we've heard from our friend Remy today about being transformed. We're thankful for what you did in his life and something that you promised to do throughout history. Lord, bring your peace. Bring your transformation that the world might be something new and honoring of you. Lord, this day we hold Pastor Bobby up to you and we ask that as he brings us your message, that you would help us to have transformed minds, that we might do what's good and pleasing in your sight. And Lord, as we bring our offerings forward, would you fill them with exuberant joy as we give from our substance, for you are true to your word to bring about your kingdom. Lord, we thank you and we offer you this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
I believe that one of the greatest gifts God has given us is the gift of faith. Faith will always overcome fear. And while you might have to face your fears, you'll never have to face them on your own. God can and will show up on your behalf. Hannah and I want to equip you by giving you some insight and daily reminders that courage isn't the absence of fear. It's taking one step in the direction of your fear. And the good news is God will be there right by your side. There are so many scriptures in the Bible encouraging us not to fear. In fact, there are over 365 of them in the scripture, almost as if the Lord gave us one for every day of the year. Today, make the decision to trust what God's word says to you, that you do not have to fear when you're living your life with Jesus. We have all dealt with fear in our lives at one time or another, but the good news is God is stronger than fear, and with him, all things are possible, meaning that you can overcome even your greatest fears. Today, with your generous gift of any size, you can request How to Face Your Fears, a special two-message audio collection from Pastor Bobby, as well as the new Calm and Courageous Journal. Filled with inspirational quotes and scriptures, this journal provides ample space for you to write down not only what you're afraid of, but also what you've seen God help you overcome in your life. Experience the power of your faithful God. Call or go online today, and for your generous gift of any size, we'll send you the two-message audio CD, How to Face Your Fears, and Calm and Courageous, the new lined paperback journal. Hannah and I want to remind you that you can face your fears. The fear you face today is very real, but so is the presence and power of God. Call or go online today and request our brand new resources that will help you win the battle against fear. Thank you for all you do to support this ministry. Your gifts, prayers, and words of encouragement mean the world to us, and we truly just couldn't do it without you. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we.
Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. If you're ever in Irvine, come down to Shepherd's Grove Press. We'd love to meet you, give you a big hug. If you have kids, bring them. We'll teach them the things of God. Well, friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving? Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. Well, I have a uh, new book coming out on, in the end of May, and uh, it's called Change Your Thoughts, Change Your World. It's based off of a sermon series I did about two years ago uh, off of the James Allen essay, As a Man Thinketh. And many of you said, that ought to be a book. So guess what? I wrote a book. And if you're the one who suggested it, you better buy one, because I took your advice. But in all honesty, uh, for those of you who are here and those who are watching on television, if you pre-order this book, it really helps me out a lot, because the sales that are predicted at like Barnes & Noble and Amazon, the, the amount of books that they hold, are based largely on pre-sales. So uh, if you want to help out your pastor, uh, please buy my book. It would be great, and I think it'll make a big difference. I really do think it'll make a big difference in people's lives. In the book is this whole idea that we're not going to be able to get into the spiritual disciplines and practices uh, that, are, that lead to a lot of these changes, but they're in the book, very spiritual disciplines at the end of every chapter that can really help you make a difference. So, okay, well, on that note, we'll just jump right in. We're going to do a series on this for over the next six weeks, and uh, today we're just going to kick it right off, and we're going to begin with the thesis, which is the title, and that is, if, it's a Dr. Peel quote, if you want to change your world, change your thoughts. Change your thoughts, you change your world. So many people are upset about the circumstances in their lives. They're upset about their jobs. They're upset about where they are. They're upset about their relational status. But they nurture the thoughts that got them there. So many people have bad circumstances, and they nurture the bad thinking that gets them to that place. Very often we war against where we are in life, but we love the way we think. And we forget that our thoughts are perfectly designed to give us the results we're getting in life. If you want to change your life and your circumstances, you have to change your thinking. You have to train your mind as you would train your body as an athlete. You have to train your mind into discipleship, into the word of God, into good thinking versus bad thinking. And then, and only then, will your life actually be transformed. You want a better future? Have better thoughts. You want to have better friendships? Have better thoughts. Uh, and, and this will change everything. It reminds me of a, there's an old proverb. A man was walking along and he saw a laborer out on a, along a sidewalk and the man was laying bricks and one after the other and had sort of a glum look on his face. And the man asked him, what are you doing here? And he responded, I'm building a wall. I'm a bricklayer. He said, okay, that's interesting. And then he continued to walk along, and then he saw another bricklayer, another man laying and cementing and doing the same type of thing. This guy looked a little bit happier. And he said, sir, what are you doing? And he said, oh, me, I'm building a church. Isn't that lovely? He said, oh, it is, it is lovely. And then he continued to walk along and saw yet a third man also laying bricks and laying cement. And he said to this man, sir, what are you doing? And he looked at him and paused for a moment with a big smile on his face and a deep look in his eyes. He said, I and building a house of God. So now you look at these three men, and all three men are bricklayers. All three men are doing the same job. All three men are on the same team, achieving the same aim. But all three are thinking about what they're doing in a different way. If you were a betting, betting person, and we had to take a wager, and you wanted to guess, of these three men, who would be in a better place five years from now? That is, who would be happier? who would be more successful, who would be achieving more in their life. Who would you bet on? I would bet on the guy that says, I'm building a house of God. And even though all three are doing the exact same work, we instinctively know that the thinking, the perspective of hard labor that doesn't pay a lot, that doesn't have a lot of glory, that the way they think about the work they're doing is going to affect their future in a big, big way. And we should make it our achievement, our goal, 
uh, our motive when we wake up in the morning to be more like the last guy and less like the first guy. To decide that our parenting, our work, our labor, our study, everything that we do, that it has a greater end than what we're doing, and to furthermore pay attention to our thinking and to decide that I will nurture the kinds of thoughts that lead to not only discipleship, but lead to achievement, that lead to better relationships, that lead to the kind of life I want. And I will stop waking up every morning and being negative and embittered about the fact that I'm not where I want to be. In the end, if you want a new life, you need new thinking. You change your thoughts, you will change your life. It all begins here. In our, in our mind. So, uh, to that, by the way, I discovered an interesting story about a man named uh, Justo Gallego Martinez, who uh, was a Trappist monk during the Spanish Civil War. In this picture, he's 93 years old, he's still alive, and he is sitting in a cathedral that he built all by himself. It's unfinished. You can see it's a little sloppy and strange. It sort of looks a bit like Gaudi, which is appropriate, being that he's Spanish. But this man who went through the Spanish Civil War, if you know any of the history of the Spanish Civil War, you'll know how horrible an experience that might have been. And as a Trappist monk, his own life was in danger, but he also saw many priests and uh, friends of his who were, were murdered. And so out of that, then, he, he had even a, a further disappointment. He contracted a tuberculosis, and was unable to continue his, his uh, you know, being a monk. And he said in his own head, Lord, if you heal me of this uh, tuberculosis, I'll build a cathedral for you. Lo and behold, he got better. And he decided, I have no money, I have nothing, but I'm going to do whatever I can to build a cathedral for God. And this whole cathedral was part of the beautiful thing of the story. He built it for free. Everything you see in there, it was donated to him or was trash or was recycled in some way. The beautiful pillars on the outside, for example, are made of oil barrels. Many of the bricks and things that were laid were given by uh, nearby construction workers who knew what he was doing and would drop off you know, used or unusable uh, construction equipment. And every day, of course, except on Sunday, he wakes up and for about 10 hours he builds his cathedral. Now the reason I show you this man is I show you somebody who not only went through difficulty in life but did something, has done something and continues to do something very impressive. And, and it's a model of even what I was talking about, the, the difference between the person who lays their bricks and says, I'm building a wall, and the person who lays their bricks and says, I'm building a house for God. That our attitudes and our thoughts, in our labor, in our work, and in our life, make all the difference in the world. God's going to change your life. He's going to change your circumstances. He's going to make things better in your life, but he's going to begin first by teaching you the simple fact that your circumstances, in large part, are the result of your thinking. And that if you want a new kind of life, you have to have a new kind of thought. This is so, so, so important. And that, in fact, if you nurture a type of thinking, it cannot remain secret. Because the more you think about something and the more you dwell on something, it'll make itself apparent in every aspect of your life. James Allen, who wrote the famous essay, As a Man Thinketh, who was also a believer and a Christian, wrote this incredible line that I think is absolutely true. Men imagine a thought can be kept secret, but it cannot. It, that is the thought, it rapidly crystallizes into habit, and habit solidifies into circumstance. If you dwell on unforgiveness all the time, if you dwell on bitterness, if you dwell on negative things all the time, if you're always saying things about yourself that you're a horrible, rotten person, or you're shameful, or all this stuff, it's going to materialize in every aspect of your life, in your work, in your discipleship, and in your relationships. But the good news is God has given us a new way, a new way to think. It's through his word, and it's through mentors and friends uh, who can change our thinking so that we can have a new kind of life. And I want you to know, God wants you to know this. God wants you to change your thinking so you can be a bold, bright, and uh, great disciple for, for his name. And of course, this thinking, that the idea that we should change our thinking is not unique to Bobby Shuler. It was truly a big part of what Paul wanted to teach the church. And that's why in many of the Apostle Paul's letters, you see so much of discipleship begins with the pattern of our thoughts. The most obvious one is the scripture that Hannah read today from Romans chapter 12. And before he gets there, Paul says, 
Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. This is in Romans 11. In other words, something to be attained and something to long for. And he says, how unsearchable his judgments and, and his paths beyond tracing. And finishes with, to him be glory forever and ever. And then continues into Romans 12. So there's this desire to have the wisdom, the knowledge, and the judgment of God. To have it inside of us. And then Paul famously says, therefore, in Romans 12, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now here he doesn't mean literally die, although he, he does for some people. I think what Paul really means here is a reflection of like what he's saying about running the race, about being willing to submit your body to the kind of discipleship training that's required to have a new kind of life. Uh, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And then what? Do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, everybody in the world does everything the same way, right? Everybody is always in the same pattern, doing the same thing every day. We as believers too often want to just mimic that, want to just go with the flow of what culture says. But he says, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. This word transformed is also an English word. In Greek, it's metamorphosis. Right? Metamorphosis means you become an utterly new thing. It's the caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It's the tadpole becoming a frog or a toad. Right? And this is what God wants for us. He wants us to, to become this new creature. Right? We're still valuable even before we're transformed. We're still loved. We still matter to him. But when God looks at us, it's like looking at an apple seed or something. You just see so much potential within this little thing that if it yields itself to the death and life of Jesus Christ, that so much can come out of this one thing. That's what God sees when he sees you. He sees just an incredible, an incredible person that can achieve and do great things for his kingdom, that can be full of love and full of his life and his ideas, that can manifest with real results. But it all, all of it, it starts in your mind. And then he says you'll be able to to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, Dallas Willard famously said that a person is a mind with a will. If you want to be a different person, you need a different mind that leads to different choices. Okay, so a new person, a new, new you, if you really want a new you, it begins with, with your, your thinking, what you think about. I remember years ago when I got my first job at... Pueblo Viejo in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was 16 years old. And, uh, you know, on the totem pole in restaurants, or at least it was this way at the Mexican restaurant I worked at, you know, at the very top, other than the manager, the coolest person in the restaurant we all know is the bartender. We all know that. For whatever reason, bartenders <laughs> are cool. Everybody knows they're cool. They have their own little club over there. You're only allowed to talk to them. And then just below them, you have the waiters, the senior waiters. And then you've got like the host and hostesses and the bus boys. And then just under them, at the very bottom, the bottom scrapers, are these people called the expediters. This was my first job. My job was an expediter, which literally means to make things faster, to bring the plates out. But it also means you get to do all the other jobs that everybody hates. Cleaning the toilets when someone throws up their Mexican food, for example. <laughs> that actually happened, among other things. And it's not, it's not proper for church to, uh, to go into these things, but. <laughs> no, but, but really, I remember once, like, for me as a person, you know, f you know, feeling very often taken advantage of and ignored and like my job didn't matter, but I, I did my best to just apply myself and do well. I remember one time, one night, I cleaned the kitchen and cleaning a kitchen in a Mexican restaurant, I just won't get into how difficult that is with all the grease and the lard and the, you know, masa flour and everything. And I'm, I'm, cl I'm cleaning up this kitchen and it is spotless, it's gorgeous, everybody's ready to go home. And this guy, this waiter, forgot to bring in some random plate full of cheese and, and rice and stuff and he takes it and he kind of plops it down because he's in a hurry and it spills on the counter and it falls onto the floor and then he's starting to run and he's like, oh, so sorry about it, I gotta go. And I'm like, what? And then the, the, my boss comes in and he comes in and he goes, Shuler, clean it up. I want to go home. 
And inside was this volcano of emotions, you know, <laughs> just so much happening, you know, inside of me. And I thank the Lord that at the, at the time, my parents had been taking me to Willie George's church, Church on the Move. And Willie George talked a lot about um, the, the importance of our thinking and the value of our work. And, th and this is just such a gift that, that keeps on giving in my life. Uh, I remember he, it was, it's attributed to Luther, although I, I think it's not really Luther who said it, but um, this idea of something like, a maid as she sweeps the floor uh, honors God with her life just as a monk does in his prayers, not because she sings a hymn, but because God likes clean floors. <laughs> and then he says, the shoemaker does his Christian duty as a pastor would, not because he puts little crosses on his shoes, but because, but because God appreciates good craftsmanship. And I remember Pastor George saying, if you're ever doing work that you, you feel like is unfair, you don't want to do, just do it for the Lord. And I remember just being like, all right, I'm going to let go of my bitterness and my anger. And can I tell you, normally, what would have happened is I probably would have been steaming all night. The next day would have been awkward between me and this guy. Either I would have challenged him directly or been like, you know, like more like a Christian, which means passive aggressive. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know what I mean? And I... And I would have had like some bitterness in my heart and some issues to work out, and I certainly would not have slept well. I would have been thinking all the comebacks I could have had and things I could have done, but I, instead I, I took Pastor George's wisdom and I said, Lord, I'm just going to clean up for you. And I just began to clean up. Oh, this is for Jesus. I'm just going to do this for Jesus. And I truly meant it. You know, as a 16-year-old, it was a big change for me to make, to make this shift as a kid. And I remember I finished, and it was fine. And I went home with peace in my heart. And I slept well, and I honestly forgot about it the next day. But I think that, that you can see how thinking, you're thinking in your work, you're thinking in your relationships, how little changes like that to when you're stuck in something that's unfair, to just give it to the Lord and even do it as worship to the Lord and, and to decide to not get embittered, to not be unforgiving, to not be angry or passive aggressive, but to, to, to do it for the Lord. It, it made a big difference in my life. Can I tell you that there are many ways in which we think in life. If we change our thoughts just a little bit, it can make everything so, so much better. And maybe the greatest endeavor of our life is to figure out what those thoughts are and how we can train our minds to think those things more and the other things less. You change one little thought in your life today, just one negative thought into a positive thought, one bad or evil thought into a good thought, your whole life will be different five years from now than it is now. That is a promise. I remember when we used to work on boats a lot. It's when I was in college and in high school, we, I was at Dana Point Harbor a lot. And um, there was one ship that has this thing called a flybridge, which is where you drive the, the boat from. And inside, there, up, up top, there's this giant silver-looking uh, chrome uh, steering wheel that no one ever used. No one ever used the steering wheel, even though it worked. What everybody used was this little janky nav box right next to it that was a little computer that had a little plastic dial and a number on it that had coordinates. And if you move that dial just a centimeter one way or the other, the nav would change and the direction of the boat would shift. And actually, if you just changed it just one tick, you wouldn't even feel the boat move. You wouldn't even be able to see a difference on the horizon. But I'll tell you something. If you did that, you would find yourself miles away from where you were before if you hadn't made that one little change. This is how your life is and will be if you can, can change some of those uh, uh, bad thoughts to good thoughts. Because good thoughts always lead to good fruit and bad thoughts always lead to bad, bad fruit. And so we must figure out what those are and figure out how to train our mind into the right kind of thinking. Amen? We all know it's true. J.D. Rockefeller is someone that I've always found to be so interesting. Some people call him a wonderful business titan. Other people called him a robber baron. Wherever you land on history, you can't deny the fact that he achieved quite a bit with his life. And he, he's, in fact, from a financial standpoint, achieved more than any other person in history. If you account for all things considered, he's probably the wealthiest person who's ever lived, certainly the wealthiest in modern times. He started a company called Standard Oil, which after an antitrust uh, suit was broken into 34 companies, two of which include small companies like ExxonMobil and Chevron. 
He was a 90% shareholder in those companies, by the way. Uh, so J.D. Rockefeller, of course, multi-multi-billionaire, so wealthy he would lend money to the federal government when they got in trouble. That's true. So J.D. Rockefeller uh, grew up in, um, in not in a great circumstance. Uh, his father, they were basically poor, kind of grew up in a single, uh, with a single mom. His dad, he did have a dad who was around from time to time, but he was just a rotten human being. He was a known con man. He had the nickname Devil Bill, right? <laughs> and Devil Bill had multiple families and multiple mistresses, was always selling elixirs and cheating people uh, out of their money. And, uh, and then his mother, though, who truly raised him, was a devout Baptist woman. And she taught him, you know, a moral life, and he really was a, a moral man. He never had... Never, he proudly said, I never took a sip of alcohol or tobacco, and I was always treated my neighbor with compassion, etc. So he was a good Baptist, right? And, uh, and one of the interesting things about uh, J.D. Rockefeller is how generous he was even when he had nothing. So there's all these accounts of him finding his neighbors in need and finding a way to get money to help them. He would lend people money or give people money outright. And then he had this tremendous love of work. So in a time where there were these unjust child labor laws and all these horrible things going on that I hate, he, he got a job at 50 cents an, a day, which even then was absolutely nothing and was immoral and wrong. And you would think you know, that he would always kind of curse the name of the boss that took advantage of this teenage boy, right? But the rest of his life, J.D. Rockefeller celebrated the day he got that job. He celebrated it as job day until he died when he was 97. Every September 26th, he had a party at his house to celebrate his first job he ever got. This is a man who loves work and who appreciates anyone who would hire him to do their labor. Uh, on top of that love for work, so that's a huge shift in, in thinking that will make a big difference in your life. He also had a sense of destiny. One day, uh, as an adult now, he was... You know, I forget what he was doing at the time. I think he was a clerk. But he was supposed to catch a train. It was one of those scenes from like a movie where, you know, back then there were no planes. So you had to get around by train. And if you didn't catch your train, you'd be delayed sometimes days. And so here he is running down, you know, the, the, the tramway or whatever you call it, carrying his bags. And you can like see the train pull away. And he's like, no, come back. <sighs> this kind of thing, you know. Well, that same train, hours later, would get into a terrible wreck. And everybody on the train died. So this affected him in a big way. He talked about it a lot, about this. He believed God spared him for a reason. And his whole life, he had these two things. One, a celebration and love of work. That just, he felt so honored to be able to be working and doing work. But the other, a sense of destiny. That every day he woke up, he, I mean... Do you think he knew what his destiny was when he woke up the next morning? Absolutely not. He just knew there was something, you know, and that was enough. And I believe these two changes in thoughts for J.D. Rockefeller, along with uh, uh, integrity, which he got from his Baptist mother, uh, created in a way J.D. Rockefeller. J.D. Rockefeller is a mind. It's a mind that made certain decisions in life. And whether we agree with all those decisions and we agree with the life of the man, you can't take away that the result of his life is first and foremost the result of his thinking. I, I hate to keep dwelling on money, but it's something that affects all of us. By the way, money is the number one topic in the Bible. Did you know that? It's mentioned more, more than faith, more than love. It's like incredible. It's, like an, it's, it's all over the Bible because it's such an important part of, of our lives. Uh, on that, uh, the Kellogg School of Management, which is at Northwestern University, did a study of boys in relation to how much they would make uh, compared to their dads. And within the bell curve, they found that almost always boys make whatever their dads make. Isn't that interesting? So that if, if you're a boy, your dad made $30,000, you're likely to make $30,000. If your dad makes $100,000, you're most likely to make $100,000. Now, there's lots of boys who are outside of that bell curve, including guys like J.D. Rockefeller. Um, but I think, so a lot of times we want to ask the question, why is that, right? And, and our natural instinct is to say it's a system, right? It's, it's that, you know, poor people stay poor because of a system. But I actually think that it's, it's because of the thinking. 
Now, this is conjecture. I don't have evidence for this. It's just what I think. I think that a boy whose dad makes 30 grand, that that's what I can make. That's what I can make and be respectable. And a boy whose dad makes six figures, that's what I have to make or my job is not respectable. There, there becomes an expectation on the life of that boy that to be a man is to make this much. Right or wrong, it is those, that thinking. I, it's, that's it. I, that's what I think. I think it's that kind of thinking that leads to those kinds of financial outcomes. Now, I don't think anybody is in church today because they want to make some money, right? Nobody's here to, nobody's here to achieve financial outcomes. But because money is something that affects all of our lives in a tremendous way, from governments and churches and schools and, and, our, and our personal lives, it's something that we all think about and measure. And who here wants less money? Anybody here want less money? <laughs> Anybody? If, if you do, we'll pass the plate again. We're happy to help you out. <laughs> okay. So, so, you know, so to be honest about that and to say that it's one very small aspect of a very big life that you're going to live. Your relationships, your goals, the things you want to build, the charity work you want to do, the volunteering you want to do, and the personal change you want to go through. You want to be a better dad, better spouse, better grandma, better grandpa? You want to be a better citizen? You want to be... A, better Christian, you, and most importantly, yeah, you want to be a better disciple, a, a more moral person, you want to beat your addiction, you want to live every day in a relaxed spirit, unhurried, loving your neighbor, living honestly, full of integrity and without worry, living within the kingdom of, the God, the kingdom of God, every day, uh, saturated in his life and love. I mean, all of this, it all, all of it begins with the way you think. If you want to change your life, you've got to change your thinking. You have to. And that begins with training. It doesn't come with just trying harder. You have to do things in your life that affect your thinking. Remember that the mind is like a garden, um, that, that it requires work every day. I remember my grandpa personally, when he lived with us years ago, uh, he, turned our back, a little, he turned our backyard into like a garden, basically. He took these boards and he made this little, you know, this big sandbox, essentially. And in that, he like would take all of the stuff, like you couldn't throw away rotten eggs, anything disgusting pretty much could not be thrown away. You know, if it was rotten eggs or rotten bread or coffee grinds or banana peels, he would be like, no, don't throw that away. And like a, you know, carrying treasure, he would bring it out to his garden to turn this clay filled, uh, uh, you know, horrible dirt into real topsoil. And he created this amazing garden. It was beautiful, and he had tomatoes and all this other great stuff. And when he left, when he and my grandma moved to Springfield, what do you think happened to that garden? I would say it was three or four weeks, and it was just like, poof, weeds. I mean, just weeds everywhere. And that's what the mind is like. It requires not only uh, caring for in terms of, you know, keeping your mind healthy, but it requires pulling of weeds, the planting of seeds, the nurturing of certain kinds of thoughts as you would plants and crops in order to yield certain kinds of fruits in your life. It is the most important uh, thing to do in your life is to guard and to train your mind. The books you read, the friends you keep, the media you consume, the things you listen to, being here is a great way of doing that, right? Being a part of a church and a community that wants a godly and good kind of thinking. So I'm going to challenge you this week to just begin labeling your thoughts. So if you, if you have thoughts that tend to really stand out in your life, maybe really noble, inspiring, brilliant, imaginative thoughts, label it and just say, that was, really, that was really interesting or that was really a beautiful thought or that was a good thing to think towards someone and the vice versa. If you start having bitterness in your heart or other kinds of thoughts you know that you, you really don't think should be there maybe if you're if you're struggling with addiction various triggers or things that sort of make you uh, think of that I want you to label those two and don't do it with shame do it like a robot okay don't beat yourself up and be like oh I'm such a bad person because I I really wanted that you know that chocolate cake and I'm so bad you know like just you know just just label it, you know, just label it and notice it and begin to think about what you think about. Begin to pay attention uh, to, to the patterns of thought in your life. Because ultimately, it starts there if we're going to change our thinking, right? If you want to change your world, you've got to change your thinking. You want to change your circumstances, you've got to change your thinking. And this is good news. It's, it's, it's simple and yet complex. 
If you think the way everyone else thinks, you'll get the results everyone else is getting. Father, we thank you and we love you. We thank you for wisdom and knowledge. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to put on the mind of Christ, that you'd help us to transform our lives by changing our thinking. God, we love you so much and we thank you that you're so patient with us. Lord, that just like any other fruit tree, we will bear our fruit in season. It doesn't always have to be right now. We thank you and we love you. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The preceding program was paid for by the friends and ministry partners of the Hour of Power.